Hi. Hi. Welcome to the presentation of the high level WebRTC API in JetStreamer. I'm Loic Lepage from Igalia. And uh, after a very short introduction, uh, I will pass the microphone to Mathieu Duponchel from Centricular to talk about the WebRTC sync. Then uh, Thibaut Saunier from Igalia2 is going to uh, present the Google congestion control and the WebRTC source. And to finish with, I will present the default scenario protocol and uh, the web interface that allow to have full communication with a uh, web browser and JStreamer. So a very short uh, introduction to WebRTC. As uh, most of you uh, know, WebRTC is a modern protocol to uh, do uh, video and audio streaming with a very low latency. It is designed to work on the normal internet with web browser and so to be able to uh, pass through uh, network interconnection uh, system like NAT and this kind of things. Basically, this is like a super seed of RTP doing all the interconnection between the different peers and then the streaming itself is done using RTP. So basically, this is the end check that is occurring when uh, you start a WebRTC connection where each peer is connecting to a stun server to know what is their public um, IP address. And then from there, they exchange their SDP uh, information and uh, find the right candidate to do the RTP connection after that. Uh, what you've got here, this is basically what is done by WebRTC Sync today in JStreamer. So to have a full working application, you've got a lot of work to do about this. This is what uh, Mathieu is going to explain right after this uh, short uh, explanation. Basically, what you've got with a high-level API, this is that. You've got everything in place to be able to communicate from a web browser, from a JStreamer, as a consumer, as a producer, uh, without having to do uh, anything more above uh, what you've got with WebRTC bin. So I'm going to give the microphone to Mathieu, and he's going to explain in detail uh, how it is done with the producer WebRTC Sync. Yeah, thank you, Loïc. Yep. Uh, thank you, Loïc. Uh, hello, I'm Mathieu. I, I work at Centricular, and uh, I started work on an element called WebRTC Sync, uh, I guess in 2021, I think, late 2020, 2021. Um, so the idea, the problem space was that uh, WebRTC bin, which is an element that uh, I, I guess uh, a lot of us have worked with in the past, uh, is a very uh, flexible element, a very low level element. But uh, using it means you, you need to, well, um, you need to uh, cover some responsibilities, to assume some responsibilities. You need to uh, be uh, wary of some pitfalls. Um, for instance, uh, Loic was mentioning that uh, with WebRTC, you're supposed to exchange ICE candidates, you're supposed to exchange uh, SDPs, etc. And that means uh, when you use WebRTC bin, uh, that signaling is left up to the, to the user. And uh, that's something that, well, uh, we have repeated in many situations, uh, du duplicated that, uh, that effort in many situations, and uh, we wanted a higher level element that could... Um, cover uh, a standard pattern that we have seen in many cases where uh, we want to connect the output of a GStreamer pipeline uh, to many consumers that uh, may want to retrieve that output uh, and consume it, uh, but who do not need to send back any data to the, uh, to the main pipeline. So the initial work that we did on this version was, uh, I think, in late 2021. Uh, someone, uh, s someone at Sequence uh, called uh, Lucas, I think is in the room, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, sponsored that work uh, at first, and uh, we published it in uh, on GitHub back, de back then. Uh, so yeah, uh, the design goals that we had for this element uh, were to uh, have a batteries included mindset, where the element would uh, do the right thing in the, the um, standard case, I guess. Um, the, the idea was that uh, as a user of the element, you would not need to implement the signaling, the passing around of uh, SDPs and ICE candidates. Uh, you would also not need to um, do any sort of codec discovery, and we're going to discuss that afterwards. Uh, and also the idea was that uh, you would be a producer 
of a stream, uh, but then you would be able to have uh, many consumers connecting to, uh, to said stream and consuming that stream. So yeah, uh, the first design goal uh, that we addressed was the idea that uh, you wouldn't need to uh, implement signaling yourself, uh, but you could still do that, uh, and you could still have many signalers uh, uh, implementations that you could use. So we needed some sort of signaling abstraction. So uh, as Loïc was mentioning earlier, signaling is a fairly simple task uh, at its core. You just need to, uh, well, uh, have some concept of session between, for instance, a, a producer and um, a consumer. You need to uh, agree on the media that is going to be transported between uh, those peers. So that's uh, the, the stage where we exchange uh, SDPs. Uh, they correspond to media negotiation, basically. And uh, after that, you need to agree on, on how uh, the media is going to be transported. And uh, that's basically what uh, exchanging ICE candidates is for and discovering ICE candidates. So the abstraction that we came up with uh, lets, you, uh, lets you do that, establish the notion of session and exchange the information necessary to uh, start streaming data. So uh, for that purpose, we, uh, we expose the G interface, a uh, simple G object G interface. Uh, that G interface can be implemented by multiple signaler objects. Uh, and then those signaler objects can be passed to a WebRTC sync instance through a property uh, that we have exposed. So you have the same element that's called WebRTC sync, and then you simply uh, change the way signaling happens by providing um, an object. So uh, we do have uh, a few default implementations upstream. So uh, right now, if you want, you can uh, either use the uh, custom protocol that we have defined, which is pretty nice, but you can also um, uh, interact with, uh, so AWS KVS, that's a lot of uh, acronyms, but uh, it's basically Amazon uh, Kinesis Video Streams is the, uh, is a, the service that uh, you can interact with with that signaler. Uh, we also have a live kit SDK since uh, uh, signaler since uh, I guess three months. I'm not very familiar with that. Uh, I think Olivier did that. Uh, but yeah, we have a signaler for that as well. And we also have a whip signaler, uh, which was ported from an earlier element uh, called whip sync. Uh, the code was very easy to port over to the uh, as a signaler. So uh, yeah, so. We also have, uh, you have the ability to pass a signaler to WebRTC Sync and have it behave in, in a certain way, but we also expose subclass elements that uh, do that automatically. So you have an explicit name and you can simply say, okay, I want um, a Whip Sync or I want a AWS KVS WebRTC Sync. That's a lot of um, acronyms again, but uh, that's how it is. And yeah. Uh, the default protocol uh, is simply, if you want to use the default protocol, you just uh, use WebRTC Sync. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the element that you would uh, use. Right, so another design goal was that uh, we wanted the element to be able to perform codec discovery. So uh, briefly, when you are producing a stream, you want to uh, propose a bunch of uh, options for codecs, for instance. Uh, you may want uh, to propose uh, uh, pro producing VP8 or producing VP9, uh, H.264, etc. But um, if we propose those formats, we want to make sure that we can actually produce them. So um, usually, I mean, uh, in many customer projects that I worked on, uh, we simply use static setups where we knew, okay, we are we are going to use X264 Inc. Uh, we are simply going to connect it to WebRTC bin. It will produce an offer uh, with a single format, and that's it. But uh, here we wanted to have something a bit more uh, powerful, where uh, we would basically uh, be able to propose multiple formats and know that we can actually uh, produce those. So that's uh, that's what we did. The idea with the with the, that phase in the in the element lifecycle is that uh, we are going to gather a list of known encoders. Uh, the, we are going to retrieve them from the uh, current GStreamer installation uh, environment. We are going to uh, collect input as well from, the, from our sync pad. And we are going to run a few discovery pipelines with that uh, actual input in order to determine the uh, exact uh, SDP that we are going to uh, propose afterwards. So 
Uh, we only do that once at the start of the, uh, when the element goes to uh, play a pose, I think, or ready. And afterwards, uh, all the information is, uh, we have gathered the caps that we will propose. And when a new consumer connects, uh, we can simply generate an SDP based on that initial discovery. So that's uh, another design goal that we covered. And it means that, uh, yeah, uh, we, we can propose uh, a, large subs a large set of formats and consumers can choose uh, between, uh, can choose the exact format that they prefer, which is obviously uh, adds flexibility and options for the user, which is nice. Um, yeah, so uh, the next design goal that we also wanted to cover was the idea that uh, you would uh, be able to provide, uh, to produce data for multiple consumers. So uh, this is a very, a very common pattern that we encountered, where uh, you're, you have a processing pipeline in GStreamer, and uh, you, you just want multiple consumers to be able to uh, retrieve it, to display its uh, output, and uh, you want uh, you want also an ability to sandbox those consumers, the pipeline for those consumers. So. Um, in the past, we used a, a, a shim where we would have a T and we would um, uh, dynamically update the pipeline, etc. But it was a fairly um, well complex way to do things, and it was a bit error prone. Uh, you could easily get into deadlocks and things like that. So instead, uh, over a few um, a few contracts at Centricular, we uh, came up with a, um, a better option, which is to use AppSource and AppSync uh, to separate pipelines. And uh, we, uh, Sebastian came up with an API in Rust, which is called S Stream Producer, and which can be uh, used to effectively achieve separation of, um, of uh, the pipelines for uh, each consumer. So this, this allows for some level of, of sandboxing. Um, it's not as, uh, as much sandboxing as you would get if you, uh, if you had, for instance, uh, one pipeline in one process for each consumer. But still, uh, you get some uh, decent insulation from uh, errors from one client, or if you have one client that consumes uh, uh, slower than another, uh, you are sure that the stream producer API is going to uh, uh, not get throttled at that point. I mean, um, it's also, uh, you can use stream producer to uh, implement uh, uh, other types of complex applications, and I would recommend that you take a look at the API, but that's not the topic for today. So yeah, uh, the default protocol that we designed was uh, was uh, thought was designed around that uh, that idea that we wanted uh, one producer and many potential consumers. So uh, we came up with uh, as a as a cons as a, uh, as so you have a signaling server that uh, that expects clients to connect through web sockets. And uh, as a client, you have the ability to register yourself as um, a producer or as a consumer or as a, what we call a listener. So uh, the idea is that producers are going to be uh, exp um, listed by consumers and they are going to be able to uh, connect to them and, connect, uh, and consume their data. And uh, the idea with listeners is, is that they can simply monitor uh, who are the producer in the system, and who are the consumers, and what are the current sessions as well. I think that's uh, also possible. So yeah, uh, that's uh, the, the initial protocol, the default protocol that we came up with, with was designed around uh, that, uh, that requirement, basically. So to quickly summarize what we ended up with in GStreamer terms, um, we, we, uh, we created a, a sync element. So a sync, uh, a sync element has uh, multiple sync pads, potentially, and has no source pads. Uh, that sync element uh, can accept any number of input streams. Uh, those input streams can be video or audio. Um, the, the element can uh, compute offer. Once it knows the, the media stream it's going to serve, it can then create SDPs based on that. Uh, these days, well, uh, since the AWS KVS uh, signaler, the element can also uh, accept offer, so uh, the remote end can uh, offer to receive, which is a bit confusing sometimes, but the remote end can offer to receive something, and uh, WebRTC Sync is going to be able to reply to that, saying, okay, you want to receive this, uh, I can give you this, that, and this, uh, and yeah, that's, I will give you this uh, in the end, is the, is the mechanics 
Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's one way that uh, that you can interact with the element as well. Uh, so we we came up with something that does support any number of consumers. And uh, yeah, uh, another nice thing is that these days uh, I think Thibaut uh, implemented that. Uh, so uh, the design with WebRTC Sync is that we wanted to perform encoding ourselves because ultimately we wanted to be able to perform congestion control on a per consumer basis. Uh, and for that, we needed to have a handle on the, on the encoder in order to change the bitrate uh, uh, of the stream for each of the consumers. Uh, it was found that uh, we were also interested in having an element that could support uh, consuming encoded streams and uh, providing them to consumers. The drawback with that is that, uh, so we support that, but it means that when you use that mode, um, you're not going to have uh, duplicated encoders, let's say, but you're going to have to uh, not perform congestion control for that case. Uh, we do have plans to share um, uh, to share encoders in the future. We have ideas. If you want to sponsor that, that would be a very nice... Uh, I have nice ideas about that, but we don't have that for now. So, uh, And I, with that, I will let uh, Thibaut, who implemented the, the GCC algorithm, uh, take over. Thank you. Thank you, Mathieu. Um, so, I'm Thibaut Sonnier, uh, working at Tigalia. I'm going to make a quick presentation about uh, congestion control and then uh, the counterpart of WebRTC Sync, which is WebRTC Source. Uh, so, congestion control aims at uh, ensuring that we have a good quality of streams, like the best quality of streams that we can uh, between two peers, uh, determining the, the, the maximum bitrate that can be used uh, for passing the media uh, between the different peers. So for that, uh, we used to have a very simple homegrown algorithm uh, that was not behaving exactly as one would want. And uh, we decided to just use the, to implement the congestion control algorithm that has been defined as an EATF draft uh, document uh, by Google. And that's basically the main algorithm that is being used in, in, uh, in, in many uh, places, such as Chromium and LibWebRTC. Uh, um, but it's also implemented in many places these days. And uh, so the idea, the, the, so that algorithm, I will not go into the details of the algorithm. Uh, I will just explain how we can use it inside JStreamer. But basically what it does is uh, looking at the TWCC feedback packets, which is, a, is a, a protocol that has been defined as part of the RTP and RTCP stack uh, protocols. And uh, thanks to all the information that you have, you can make some statistic and uh, doing some probing uh, of the connection, you can define what is the maximum bitrate that can be used. And uh, yeah. So in terms of what it offers in JStreamer, uh, we implemented the RTP GCC BWV element, <laughs> many letters there. Uh, and yeah, it's a JStreamer element that is separated from uh, WebRTC Sync, so you can reuse that in many places. Uh, in other places. Um, what it does is listen to the events that it gets in, it, on its source pad, um, the RTP TWCC packets event, which is something that is uh, emitted, uh, sent from the RTP session. So you have to place the element before the RTP session. And then, um, and then uh, for example, if you are using RTP bin or RTCP bin, or RTC bin um, you can connect to the request aux sender callback and just uh, return uh, a new instance of RTP GCC WE. I will, <laughs> I will manage it. Um, and then it exposes one property, which is the estimated bitrate. So it's very simple to use. It does everything in the background for you. Um, connect, like I was explaining, running the whole algorithm. And um, you just need, and you really need to do that to. Uh, to uh, listen to the estimated bitrate um, notify signal that is emitted by the, RT, by the element <laughs> and, uh, and respond to the estimated bitrate by setting the encoders so that the bitrate it produces is actually what has been estimated because the whole uh, process of estimating the bandwidth requires that the, the, the bitrate that is being sent in the connection is the one that we are estimating. That's part of the process. Um, yeah, I think that's it for using and uh, the okay the um, congestion control part. So now I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the consumer, which is a source element. It's a very simple 
Jet Streamer Source basically it wraps WebRTCP bin, WebRTCP bin, Web bin, and uh, it acts uh, as a source element. In terms of implementation, the nice thing is that we can reuse the signaler objects that has been defined as part of uh, WebRTC Sync, so that one can um, you have one implementation of the of the signaler object for each protocols that are being uh, uh, that we handle. And internally, we just listen to some signals on that signaler to be able to uh, connect to the peers that the user choose uh, in the, for the WebRTC source. Um, so for example, well, we still have work to do on some signalers to be able to use them uh, for the source. But basically, it's, it's usually simple. It depends a bit. We have uh, some work in progress to handle the WIP protocol so that you can use uh, it will be another subclass of WebRTC source for specialized for the WIP uh, protocol, but you could also, the same way as you can with WebRTC sync, uh, set a signaler to the element so that it, instead of uh, using the default signaler that uses the protocol that we defined ourselves, you can use other protocols, and it's very simple. Um, the source is also able to negotiate the right SDP, uh, activating uh, the extension, like negotiation, negotiating properly the extensions that are needed, uh, for example, to handle uh, congestion control. So you need to act it will activate the, the TWCC uh, extension. So uh, in terms of usage, it's very simple. What it does, you can just, um, so for example, here we just run a WTC source, um, set the, the producer ID, and that will use, uh, listen to the, connect to the right uh, signaling server, well, to the local signaling server in that case because we don't provide any well, and it will do the decoding internally because what we wanted is also to be able um, to negotiate properly the, the encoders, well, the codecs that can be used, so it will look at the registry, uh, make sure that we have decoders for the, for the, the formats that is being negotiated uh, during the SDP negotiation, and um, so it does the decoding in that case. But uh, you can also make sure that it does not do the decoding, so that if you provide, well, in that case, uh, so. uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm missing a slide. Anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry. So instead of uh, putting video extra, you could say, okay, I want X264 to be outputted by the WebRTC source, and um, WebRTC source will be able to avoid uh, doing the decoding and everything, and we'll consider that the user knows what he's doing, and it will just uh, output uh, encoded streams. That's very useful. For example, if you need to do a, a quick SFU and you just want to retrieve streams from uh, many places and redistribute them, uh, in different places, uh, you could use that, and yeah, that's very useful. <laughs> uh, it implements the UI handler interface, so you can just use it with Playbin and, or anything. So for example, if you need to play uh, many streams from many places, you can actually use the, um, the signaling uh, object, instantiate it as a listener, and then know all the producers that you have on the system, and start instantiating uh, pipelines to play back all the all like the streams that you want, uh, and you can just reuse uh, URI decode bin or whatever, um, just providing the UI this way, and setting the pure ID of the of the producer. Uh, in terms of announcement, um, what we need to do at some point is because uh, uh, right now when you are using it inside Playbin or URI decode bin, the decoding will always happen inside the source, which is not ideal, as the user doesn't have control over uh, like the codec selection, which is something that, uh, the decoder selection, sorry. So that, for example, um, well, the user will, will lose control over um, yeah, the, the selection of the playback elements. And this is something that we need to uh, investigate, think about a good mechanism, because it's not ideal right now. Um, and we might want to um, be able to use uh, WebRTC source as an ingestion server so that it will be a hand point where many uh, producers can send the streams so that you will end up with one uh, source that will handle uh, connections from different producers 
And the producer only has to know one endpoint. He doesn't have to negotiate anything. He just says, okay, send me to that endpoint. And then uh, the application will ingest all those streams and all of them the way it wants. Uh, so we have to think about how to link the streams together if you have audio and video, for example. Uh, adding pads dynamically, that implies a lot of things. So we still need to uh, do some design research and uh, see what is the best way to implement that. And uh, I will let Loic continue to talk. Thank you, Thibault. So, uh, Thibault and Mathieu talk about uh, this uh, new signaling protocol that uh, we integrated in all those high-level elements. Um, this protocol, which is a default one that is available directly, if you just do a pipeline with GST launch and you put a web RTC sync or web RTC source, uh, this is a protocol that is going to be used by default. Uh, idea behind this protocol is to be, uh, it's based on WebSocket for the transposition with uh, JSON for the data encoding. So this is very, very easy to uh, have it portable, to write a client for it. And one uh, very interesting point is that this is 100% compatible with web applications. So this is what I'm going to talk right after that, because you've got JStreamer and lots of people using web for, for, I don't know, web conferences or remote video access. Today, lots of people are using the web as UI. So this is interesting to have this uh, possible interconnection. So um, I, I made some schema to uh, explain a little bit the main um, uh, comments you've got in this protocol. I'm not going to pass lots of time about this. I wrote this more uh, for later on if you want to consult uh, the slides to have a uh, um, clearer idea about those comments without having to read the whole source code where well, it is available here. But basically, this is what Matthew explained before. This is exchanging the SDP message, exchanging the ICE candidate, and to be able to uh, list uh, which uh, producer are available on the uh, signaling server network to be able to uh, easily connect to them without having to, tr to uh, exchange the ID of the, con the producer uh, by another mean. Uh, basically, this is what happens when you connect, uh, when you want to create a, a, a session. Uh, this is what you exchange. Uh, as you can see uh, at the beginning, you uh, do your connection to identify and to have your ID. Then you can make, as a producer, make an offer with a SDP content. The consumer can answer this with a SDP answer and then it's exchange the ICE candidate and it's finished by uh, establishing the RTP streaming session, which is totally independent from the signaling server. So what uh, allows this protocol, as this is based on WebSocket, this is directly accessible from uh, JavaScript in, in a web browser. So the idea is to have uh, a small JavaScript library that allow connecting to the same signaling server and to be able to connect to a WebRTC sync and WebRTC source. Uh, While well, the architecture is quite uh, um, simple, this is uh, a layer architecture where you've got a main class which will come channel, which is a communication channel that in fact is implementing the uh, default signaling protocol client. And it is responsible for uh, creating the producer session. This is what you are going to produce from your web browser to uh, the other peers. And uh, it will also handle an array of consumer session which are all the link you are showing on your web page that you are consuming from external uh, producers. Uh, basically, the client session, which is uh, all the uh, remote consumer client connected to your producer session and the consumer session, uh, this is the same kind of session. This is a WebRTC session. This is the one that handles the uh, WebRTC connection itself. All the rest, basically, this is a, a, a client to communicate with a signaling server with a default protocol implementing in WebRTC sync and WebRTC source. Uh, there is uh, something cool that uh, we haven't talked about until there. Uh, this is what I uh, put as remote controller is that a web RTC sync uh, is able to connect a back data channel when you connect from a producer to a consumer. And this back data channel uh, understands the GST navigation event. So it allows you from a remote peer to uh, send back 
uh, input data, your mouse position, uh, your keyboard, and things like this to the WebRTC sync. So it's a little bit as if you've got some kind of remote pipeline because where before you had, uh, for example, your source that understands GST navigation event, and you've got the sync on your own computer showing the video, and you can then click on the video and the event are communicated. You've got the same thing, but your video sync can be uh, half a world away uh, through WebRTC. So this is, this is very um, uh, interesting for a remote computer access or things like this. So uh, the usage of this API, the JavaScript API, is very, very easy. Basically, uh, before receiving the, the, um, the DOM content loading event, you just put in one uh, global object your configuration to put the metadata, the signaling server URL. And then when the DOM content event is fired, directly uh, the library is going to connect to the signaling server. And then you have uh, three different roles you can assess. You can be a listener, you can be a producer, you can be a consumer, and you can combine all those roles together. Basically, the listener mode, this is uh, a mode that is uh, activated very uh, simply, just adding a listener. Uh, it will give you, each time that a producer on the same uh, signaling network uh, is created or destroyed, uh, you will receive uh, event producer added, producer remove. So you know you've got a new producer. And you've got the idea of the producer and whichever metadata you want to put in your application. And so you can decide, for example, to automatically connect to a producer. Or you know at least in the list of producers that you can connect to this if you want to consume the uh, audio and video produced by this producer. Uh, for the consumer, this is the same principle. You've got a create consumer session where you put the producer ID uh, with the, the identifier of the remote producer and directly uh, you've got access to uh, the streams that you can attach to a video element and play directly uh, the video. So this is very easy and you've got some uh, classical DOM event to know uh, if you've got some error or when it is closed or is the streams, for example, has changed. Uh, and for the producer, this is the same thing. And you've got the same kind of callbacks uh, to know when uh, you've got some client that connects to you. So we've got a small uh, demonstration to show you how everything of this uh, works. So uh, this demo is basically the demo you encounter in uh, GST plugin RS. Uh, this is a demo that is inside the uh, WebRTC thing. So here I, I will do, for example, the start capture that is going to take my webcam. And uh, this is a producer. Here we are in the web interface. And I'm going, for example, launch with a simple GST launch, the web RTC sync. As you can see, the listener, the listener, the web listener has detected you had a new remote stream that has just connected here. If I click on it, I'm connecting to this stream. And so I've got access to this video, and this is the magic of what I talk about. Here, I can send event. Here, this is a video, a video in the website. This is not a remote website. This is a video. This is a video that is emitted through WebRTC Sync on my computer, and I'm connecting with a web interface to this video. And thanks to the data feedback channel, I can control it as if I were on a real web page. But as you can see below, this is really a video. This is not a, a web page. So here I've got this remote stream. Well, if I'm launching more web RTC sync, or if, for example, I'm connecting, if I can, <laughs> with the microphone is not the easier stuff. But if I'm connected, for example, from my phone, to the same web page, and I'm connecting a new stream. You can see that below, I've got a new web client that is connected. Oh, and that's it. And this is from, uh, from my phone. So connected to the same web page. <laughs> and the, the last thing to show you the web RTC source element. So I'm going to copy, I'm going to copy, for example, 
if I can uh, to copy the, uh, this producer ID, which is a peer ID that uh, you, you saw, that um, Thibault showed you with a web RTC source. And if I'm launching now, thank you, if I'm launching now the web RTC source, here, this is the web RTC source, but sorry for the resolution. I put HD resolution, but the screen is smaller. And th this is uh, uh, the video sync from uh, Ola. I've got some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 that <laughs> the, the, the Wi-Fi is not super stable, sorry. But <laughs> this was a web RTC source element connecting to the same uh, client ID here. So. Oh. So this was for the demonstration. So now if you've got uh, some questions. Uh, earlier, um, Pexip showed that they were using TWCC as a feedback channel. Are you using the same TWCC algorithm for congestion control? Yeah, so basically the RTP session element emits uh, RTP TWCC uh, packets, I think that's the name of it, uh, event in the pipeline so that the, 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 the congestion controller element receives that and that's from there that we, we, we run the algorithm. Yeah. So it's from the TWCC feedback packets, basically. TWCC is not an algorithm per se. No, yeah, it's just the, the protocol. The that, manages the, the, that manages the feedback. Is it the same similar one that, that Pex was talking about? Uh, we are running out of time already. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, maybe one question. <laughs> um, for the um, bandwidth control, you only change the bitrate on the encoder, right? No frame rate or resolution depending on the content would be nice. Yeah. So we have some uh, algorithm to define what is the best way to reduce uh, the bitrate. Uh, we set the bitrate on the on the encoders, but if we go below a certain threshold, we can we will uh, reduce the frame rate uh, or uh, rescale the video, and depending on uh, depending on the on the on the bitrate that we we have estimated. So that's all done already. Yeah. There is there is no way to choose right now, uh, so we have our own our own uh, defined metrics. But uh, the idea is that we should have a callback at some point that lets you, uh, as a user, define. Okay, I have that bitrate, that input video. I will I will choose those parameters. Yeah. But it's not it's not. Yeah yeah. Yeah. Right now right now as a user you don't have control over that. We make the decision for you, but. We definitely have at some point to uh, announce the user experience on that side. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>